Hey everybody, it's five o'clock. Hope everybody's having a super great GDC. For people just coming in, there are some seats down the first few front rows. Don't be shy. So uh, I gave a talk last year um, about uh, game studio management and how studios should be structured. And I was surprised to learn that, oh, I still have a bunch of things that I'd still like to say about that. Um, but this year I'm giving a kind of a different talk, game studio leadership. So this is much more about what you personally, as a studio leader, things that you should maybe be considering doing. And it's called game studio leadership. You can do it. I'm a little nervous because it's all new material, but I'm confident that I can do it. So it's going to be fine. So just a little bit about my background. A long time ago, I used to be a circus performer, um, a traveling juggler with a number of different troops, like the Freihofer uh, Circus Troop right there. And inexplicably, I went from there to start becoming a programmer at IBM. <laughs> then I was working at the phone company for a while. Uh, then I managed to get the phone company to send me to graduate school to learn about virtual reality, and that I leveraged into a job at Disney. Um, so sorry, phone company. Um, and then I was, I was at Disney for seven years, and then I, about 15 years ago, I moved to Pittsburgh. I started teaching at Carnegie Mellon University. And also, I started a studio called Shell Games, which uh, started as a small studio and has grown quite a bit. So a lot of the lessons I'll be talking about, uh, talking about here, a lot of it's going to be what I've learned kind of uh, running Shell Games over the years. But also, these other organizations that I was a part of were very instructive to me about different ways uh, to deal with leadership in, uh, in creative situations. Uh, here's some footage of what Shell Games looks like on the inside. We've got about 105 people. Uh, we, pr we produce multiple games at a time. Typically between 6 and 12 games is not at all unusual for us to be uh, working on. If you're wondering how we got that cool footage, uh, it's very simple. Um, just uh, drones flying around inside. That's not distracting at all. Um, uh, yeah, we're not going to keep those up full time. We tried it. It's, it's, not, it's not good. So who's this talk for exactly? So it's definitely for people who are interested in taking on some amount of studio leadership, or maybe you're already doing some studio leadership. I've tried to make it so that it will work for people doing small studios with just a handful of people. And also, maybe you had a small studio and it got a little bigger, and it got a little bigger, and oh my god, you're really freaking out right now. And so growing studios, uh, growth is a very one of the most challenging parts of studio management. Or maybe you're not really running some independent studio. Maybe you're part of some large gray entity, but somewhere deep inside that entity, you're running a small team. And uh, a lot of the same things apply. And so we'll talk about some of those things as well. Uh, so I call those embedded studios. So when it comes to studio management, I often think about airports. Airports are kind of like snowflakes. Have you noticed how they're all different? Like no two airports are alike. They're like radically different from each other. And some people say that studio management is like airport design. No one seems to know the right answer. And no matter how you do it, people are unhappy, right? <laughs> And I know that sounds, you know, people say that, but I'm here to tell you that no, you can do it. You can uh, do leadership inside a studio. So now why would you do this anyway? Like why does someone go and uh, go take on the ridiculous endeavor of starting and trying to run a studio? Now for some people, you know, it may be that you just don't like the idea of working for someone else. Or maybe you tried working for someone else and you got tired of making the wrong games with the wrong people the wrong way, right? And you have a fantasy about like, I'm just gonna cut these chains and I am gonna go out and I'm gonna do things the right way. Um, here's a movie to illustrate that. We got our audio up there. Scott, are we good? All right, here we go. This is the story of one who will become leader of the Great Rebellion. Princess of power, 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 power. That is the best echo ever. I just really like that echo. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there saying, yeah, no, I get it. I really, that's what I want to do. I want to pick up the sword and I want to go out there and do this. But some of you are saying, like, but I'm not sure. 
Shira, I'm not exactly relating um, to that. Uh, Shira is not exactly someone that I'm relating to. And if you feel that way, I would like you to consider that every woman who comes to GDC, 95% of the time they see male role models on stage and that's how they feel. Um, and so we, we can all kind of, you know, think about being Shira. Like we can, we can handle that just for, just for one day, for, for one moment because one thing I really, I mean, it's exciting. We're seeing more women come into the game industry. One thing I'm really hoping to see is more and more women running their own studios. Is that right, ladies? Yeah. Because I'll tell you, ladies, if anyone can do it, you can do it. Yes. Actually, ladies, actually, if, you don't, if you'll indulge me, just the ladies right now, what I want to get is for the honor of Grayskull, on the count of three. All right, ready? One, two, three. Oh, that was kind of awesome. <laughs> Sometimes there's parts in the talk that are just for me. <laughs> it's okay. That's okay. That can be a thing. All right. So you decided you're going to start a studio. You've got, you've got the fantasy. You're going to go and do this. So you have the plan. So here's the plan. Simple plan. Number one, build a studio. <laughs> Number two, make awesome games. Yes. This is the plan. Excellent plan. Before we embark upon this plan, we should consider what a game actually is, right? So games interact with the mind, right? So games are machines that interact with the mind. And this is why they're so hard to make, because the mind is super complicated and machines are super fragile. But it's cool, because when they interact with the mind, like amazing stuff happens and the machine produces joy and money, right? That's amazing. So that's what a game is, a machine that interacts with the mind to produce joy and money. Of course, who would not want to make that? That's amazing, right? So how are you going to do that? Well, you can work on your own, but you can only go so far on your own. So you've got to get some people together, right? So you get a group of people together, and they're going to work on your game. And this sounds great. This sounds like a great thing to do. That's what building a studio is. And this is not easy because unfortunately the world is a chaotic place. So in this talk to represent chaos, I'm gonna use the ancient Greek symbol for chaos, which many people are aware is the Sharknado. <laughs> All right, because the world is full of chaos that wants to rip your studio apart. It turns out that Game developers want things like they want to eat and have a life and all these things that require money and they require freedom from distractions. So chaos can come from an awful lot of places. And how are the developers going to deal with this chaos that's going to rip apart the game development process? They're not. You're going to do that. That is what you're going to do. That's when you picked up the magic sword, that was the deal right, that you're going to be the one that deals with the chaos so that they can focus on the process of getting the game made. And this is the difference between leaders and followers. The thing to think about is that what good followers do is they excel in orderly situations. An orderly situation is set up, the followers are kind of given some kind of marching order, and they go and they do it super, super, super well. That's what followers are about. Leaders, on the other hand, they need to excel in chaotic situations. Now, everybody does some amount of leading and following anywhere in their job. Even if you're just sitting down and you're going to code something up, you run into kinds of chaos and you've got to deal with it and you've got to take some level of leadership in that. But the leadership I'm talking about is the, is the leadership that destroys the chaos that will destroy your studio. Right? That's what you as a studio leader, that is your job, to kill those Sharknados that want to rip your studio to pieces. And that's tough, right? Because you're like, oh my God, I don't want to deal with all that chaos. That's really hard and that's, that's really difficult. And I'm here to tell you, you can do it. You can do it. And we'll talk about how you're going to do it. Okay, so how are you going to do it? You need to protect the developers from all this chaos. And that's what building a studio is. A studio is a boundary and a border that kind of finds a way to keep the chaos away so people can focus on making amazing games. And one of the main ways they're going to do that, one of the main things that keeps chaos away is money, 
right? If people have money to take care of their, their lives and their food and their rent and all that, they can focus on doing the things that they love and the chaos can stay away. Um, the leading cause of ripping studios apart is getting not having enough money to kind of get your stuff going. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But all that goes well, then you get rid of the chaos and everybody can focus and you're making amazing games. But where are you gonna get this money from Right, because uh, that's a question. And hey, before we even talk about where you get the money from, where are you gonna get the people from? Like, where are these people coming from? So maybe we better revisit the plan. All right, plan one, build a studio. Um, okay, and then what? Then you're gonna protect the studio. And you need to protect the studio with money and other things. And then you're gonna make awesome games. Okay, so build the studio, protect the studio, make awesome games. Let's pause for a moment now to talk about some of the concrete things in terms of building a studio. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about these, I'm just gonna kinda skim over it real fast because you can find out about this stuff in other places. But if you haven't done it before, one of the first things you're gonna wanna start with is getting some kind of lawyer because uh, you need a lawyer to help you do things you can't do on your own. Like for example, start a legal entity, starting a company of some kind. You're gonna want to do that because it's a form of protection for you and for uh, your, your other employees. And a lawyer will help you do that. Likely you're going to want some kind of accountant so you can help get the taxes done and get, uh, you know, get, get those sorts of things rolling. And you're gonna need some kind of payroll service system. These things are all easily obtainable. Anybody who starts like a hairdressing shop or whatever has to do all this, you can do it too. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on that. You're going to have the question of office space. Do you want to, are you just going to work out of your home, just work out of Starbucks, or are you going to get some kind of office space that you rent? You're going to have to work that out, talk to a real estate agent. You'll have the question of insurance. Is your, are, are you, as a studio owner, providing health insurance and, and all of that? Of course, there's going to be equipment. Are people just bringing their own equipment, or are you providing equipment? And then, of course, finally, you've got to have some people for this studio. So there's your quick eight step process to getting a studio built right there. You need to do at a minimum those, those eight things. And now some people say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are we getting a bunch of people in here? We haven't even decided what the studio is doing. Shouldn't we have like an idea? Shouldn't we start with like, I have this grand vision of the perfect game, and then I will go out and get the people for that perfect game and go and do that. And that is a way you can go and do that. But there's a lot of people who advise that, no, 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 that's not the right way to do it. There's an excellent book that I encourage people to check out called Good to Great. It's a study of companies that started out pretty good and eventually became great and stayed great for 10 years or more. And it finds patterns between them all, that, uh, how they all similarly excelled. And one of the things that it found is they did not start with an amazing idea. That isn't how they began. They, they went at it differently. Instead of saying, I've got a great idea, let's get the right people for that idea. They instead, they use this analogy of a bus, right? The idea is you could say, hey, I've got a bus and it's going to this very specific place. Let me get people and let's get them on the bus. But they say, no, don't do that. Get your bus, go get the best people you can. Get them all on the bus and then all look at each other and say, now where should we go, right? Because if you have a, a bunch of smart people together, then they're going to do something really smart. Ideally, you're gonna get people smarter than you, right? And they are gonna do something really smart. So one of, the, one of the principles from that book is first figure out who, and then let the right people figure out the right thing to do. So that's something to think about and something to consider. Certainly, if you're uh, building a game development studio, you're going to be having the three main types of game developers, um, sometimes referred to as dwarves, uh, elves, and men. Uh, other times referred to as engineering, art, and design, <laughs> slash marketing, slash everything else, right? And that's sort of a joke, but also everyone knows it's like, no, it is really kind of like that. These, these are three different groups of people who think about the world in really, really different ways. And you're going to need those different people, and you're going to need to be ready for the fact that they're not going to agree on everything. Okay, so that's fine. So you're gonna get uh, a bunch of great people, and now, now what are you gonna do? Well, one other thing to think about um, is other ways to look at people. You want just, you're like, sure, I want great artists and great engineers, but is that enough? Am I just looking at skills? Um, so this, uh, I got this interesting formula from Paul Stefanuk, who used to work with us at, at Shell Games, and I found it very interesting and very useful that often the right way to think about developer value, don't just think about skills. 
Um, what, what Paul suggested to me, and I still believe is very true, is that you take skills and you multiply that by enthusiasm, and then you multiply that by respectabilitude. Now, what is respectability? That's a crazy word. Why would, you, why would you even say that? It's a complicated idea. The idea is this. The ability to make others feel respected. Okay? Not how much respect you show to others necessarily, and not how much respect you've earned from them, but how much you make other people feel respected. I know that sounds a little oblique, but um, I totally agree with Paul that if you give everybody scores on these three numbers from like zero to three, and then multiply those three numbers together, it gives you a pretty good sense of how much someone's value really is. Because someone with, a, with like a, a three in skills and a three in enthusiasm and a zero in respectability like has zero or possibly negative value even. Maybe there should be a negative respectability, I don't know. So someone who has all twos has an eight, someone who has all threes has a 27, and like it makes a big difference. But these are three really important things to think about when, you, when you're trying to pick the right people. Uh, and yeah, even three, and three times three times zero is zero. Now, a lot of people may have heard um, Jason Vandenberg in, the, in past years has talked a lot about the big five personality types. And this is, psychologists in the world don't agree on much, but this is one thing they all agree on, that when you want to evaluate, like, what are the types of personalities that people have, there are these five uh, spectrum. Um, are, are people more curious or more cautious? Are they introverts or extroverts? Are they more nervous or are they more secure? These opposite ends of the spectrum. And then what you can basically do is for almost every individual, you can kind of do a little test and figure out where do they, where do they reside on each of these spectra. So this leads to a question, what personality type is best for game development, right? And the answer that people figure out pretty quickly is like, no, they, all of these things have pros and cons. Being more curious is a pro, but it can get you in trouble. But being more cautious is a pro, but it can also make you too safe, right? Every single one of these has a pro and has a con. And ideally, most people quickly realize what they want is they want to cover the spectrum. They want a mix of people that will have little red X's in all the parts of all five spectra. Which that way, great, we're covering everything. We got people who are thinking about risk and people who are thinking about adventure, you know, all of those things. We have people who like to just stay in a work, people who like to go out and network, that's all great. But the important thing to realize is these are all opposites. These people are not going to agree with each other, right? Just inherently, what we're saying is if the optimal studio covers all these bases, the optimal studio is at odds with itself all the time. And Guess whose problem that is? It's your problem, right? Because when you picked up the sword, oh my God, now that's totally your problem. And a related question, we often think about what skills do I need? What skills do I need? I talked about skills and enthusiasms. An excellent question is what enthusiasms do I need? What kinds of champions do I need? Because sure, you have people who are good at this and good at that, but what are people excited about? Maybe someone's not good at playtesting, but they're super excited about it, and they really want to learn about it, and they really are going to defend it and protect it. Maybe someone really cares about user experience. Maybe someone uh, really cares about marketing the studio, right? Thinking about having a diverse collection of enthusiasm so that you have the right champions in your studio is really important. So those are some tips for getting the right people. Okay, so check. Number one, we built a studio, we had a lawyer, we got great people, now we're good. So now, part two, we've got to protect the studio from chaos. And we're going to do that by going out and getting some money. I keep this little statue in my, uh, in my office uh, that I found somewhere. Because I love it because it just, for me, it sums up finances in the game industry perfectly. <laughs> right? The money's right there. Just grab it. Just go ahead. Just take the money. It's right there. Just go and get it. Right? But unfortunately, going and getting it is not so easy. And even once you do get it and you give it to the developers, they, <laughs> they go through it super, super fast. So money is on your mind a lot if you're, uh, you're going to be making your own studio and, and trying to run it. So let's talk about the four different ways that you're going to get money. Number one, scenario one, you use your own money. You know, you're independently wealthy. You have this big sack of cash. You're like, let's do it. Let's, let's make this awesome game. That's great. If you can do that, excellent. Good for you. And I've seen a lot of people do that. So often they'll do it by scrimping and saving, uh, but they'll do it. So let's just talk about how that works. So there's your studio, and you're going to put your own money into it. 
and that's great. And then boom, it starts making games and the games start coming out and that's great. And then you've got your big vacuum machine on top and it sucks the money out of those games. And then it puts them back in and hopefully this virtuous cycle just keeps going on to infinity. Now, of course, we all know that sometimes that doesn't happen. We had a great round table this morning. People talked about, oh, we made a game, we we're so successful and then we got complacent and uh, the money dried up and we got in all kinds of trouble. Um, but this is the easiest and best situation. So if you're already rich, like, good, congratulations. You're in a good position for this. But we're not all like that, so let's look at scenario two, which is the work for hire scenario. Um, and this works this way, all right? So we've got our studio, where's the money come from? It's not our money, it comes from somebody else. Somebody says, hey, make a game for me. And then, well, what happens with this game? Uh, they, you produce the game, but it's, it's their game, not, not yours. See, I made the games a different color because it belongs to them now. And then do I bring down my money pipe and suck the money out? No, they have their own money pipe and they're gonna suck any money that the games get and that goes away and you don't get any new money for that. But at least you got to make games and that's cool and you got to do that. Um, so, uh, oh look, there's my sad dry money pipe and like nothing's happening with that. Um, and some people are like, ugh, I don't like this. The whole point of my own studio is so that I don't have to make other people's games. And if you feel that way, you probably want to avoid work for hire. But work for hire can be really cool. You can work with amazing world-class partners and have a great time working with them. And then when the project's over and they're going all insane and they're getting ready to lay people off, you're like, that's cool. We'll go work over here now. Everything's fine. You know, good luck, guys. We'll, we'll let you have that. So you, you can kind of, if you enjoy it, it can be really great. Our studio, we've done an awful lot of work for hire over the years. We've, we've stayed completely independent because of that. Um, we, we've, we, it's not uncommon for us to be doing 60 to 80% of what we're doing is work for hire, use the profits, and then uh, to, to use those on our own IP is not at all unusual. Then there's scenario three, used to be super common, the publisher scenario. Now it's less common and now it's hard, you know, hard one, but it comes and goes. So let's just be clear about how that works. Uh, how's the publisher scenario work? There's your studio and what happens? Okay, they put in a bunch of money, but some of it's your money. They kind of expect you to put some of your own money in. That's kind of, they like, we, we need you to have skin in the game, Mr. Shell. Okay, yeah, I got it. We'll have some, that sounds gross, but I'll, we'll do it. <laughs> And then you make the games and depending on how the deal works, right, sometimes you own them and sometimes they own them and sometimes you own part of them and so that's negotiable. So some games are owned and some aren't. And then what happens with the money? Like you both bring money pipes of different kinds and you have a big wrestling match about money pipes trying to figure out who can get how much and all that. And this is the kind of the traditional publisher relationship which can be really nice for uh, studios because it kind of reduces your risk but you still have home run protection. If you got a big hit you can still get really rich off of it and that, and that, can, be, that can be pretty nice. But publisher deals are harder to secure than they used to be. And then scenario four, investments. All right, how's this work? All right, I got my studio. It's all somebody else's money. You know, you might put your own money in, but you probably won't, right? So somebody else has brought their money in. This is great, this sounds good so far. I don't have to worry about my own money. And what do they want in exchange? Oh my God, right? <laughs> Oh, it's suddenly it's not your studio anymore. Well, you still have part of it, but most of it is going to be theirs, or maybe, well, I don't know, there's going to be a big fight about who owns how much of a studio. And then you're producing games, and you own some, and they own some. Now, the money pipe, like, sucks the money back in, and that's pretty cool, but, like, wait, now, whose money is this now? That it's not totally my studio anymore? Now, it depends on how you work that out, right? And the idea of majority control and who, has, who owns more than half of the studio ends up being really, really crucial. And it's really hard for game studios to get investor money sometimes because investors generally are coming from the tech sector. They're not thinking about games as games. They're thinking about games as a platform. How is your game a platform? I don't want to hear about the game. I want to hear about your platform, right? And what do they want? They want 10x, right? 10x. What does that mean? It means, well, if I give you $2 million, I expect to see $20 million back for my investment. Oh, my God. That's a lot. Really? Your game is that good that they're going to put in two million and get 20 million out? You've got to be pretty bold to be able to go and tell them that story, but people do it all the time, right? Uh, in, case you're not, in case you're not clear on what 10x means, it's this many. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of monies. It's, uh, it's a lot. Um, but particularly if you've got a platform story, it can be very valid and it can work out really well 
um, in, in a lot of scenarios. So those are the four main scenarios for raising money. Now, some people do just one, some people mix and match, and then there's others. We didn't talk about crowdfunding, and I didn't talk about that because almost nobody can survive purely on that. People use that as a supplement. You might also get grant funding for something you do, right? And that can be a supplement, but again, nobody can subsist entirely on that. And so if you're gonna keep a studio going over, over time, you're gonna have to be thinking about this a lot. And if you don't like thinking about money and you really don't enjoy it, well then you need to do something different. Um, let me ask you, does anyone know who that is? Say again? Uh, Walt Disney? It is not Walt Disney. That's a good guess though. A close relation, right? Right. You know, anybody recognizes Walt Disney, but who recognizes Roy Disney, right? Roy was there with Walt every step of the way. When they created the studio back in the 20s, it was the Disney Brothers Studio. Roy was more or less the CEO of that place almost the entire time. But he realized that having Walt as a front man was a better way to get business because Roy was a consummate businessman. He knew how to make the money work and Walt sure as hell did not. Right? Walt was bad with money. He was a creative genius who wanted to do these incredible, beautiful things. And when it came to money, it was, he was this kind of a scary disaster. But Roy was there to kind of deal with the money. So you've got to think about, like, are you cool? Are you, like, into the game of, like, getting the money and dealing with that? If you are, that's fine. Do that. If you're not, get some help because you're going to need the help because it's never easy. Okay. So we got the people. And somehow we got the money. Awesome, finally, studio's done, studio's protected. Now I can get to what I've always wanted. I'm gonna make awesome games. I'm not gonna make awesome games. What is happening? No, no you're not. Because you run the studio now, and that's not your job anymore. <laughs> you have a new job. Your job is optimize the studio. That's your job. And you're like, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got my people and I've got my game. Everyone knows a great game is the most important thing. That's my top priority. No, it's not. Your number one priority is making sure that your team has everything they need to make a great game. Your number two priority is making sure that game is great. So let me just make that clear. Your team's top priority is making the game great. Your top priority is making the team great. Because if you're not gonna do it, who's gonna do it? There's no one else who's gonna do it. And that has to be your priority. And again, if you're not up for that, if you're not ready for that, you wanna think twice about really, am I the one who's really gonna run the studio? Because it's the primary responsibility of leading a studio team. And it's tough, man, because the team wants all these things. They want all this stuff, and if they don't have the stuff, they're not happy, and if they're not happy, you don't have a good game, and everything is bad. They want so many things. Oh my God, they want like an alphabet of things, <laughs> right? It's actually not a whole alphabet. It's weirdly half of an alphabet, technically a alphabet. <laughs> also known, this one in particular is the alphabet of happiness. TM. <laughs> and you're like, I don't want to solve these problems. I don't want to, oh, I got to find ways to get people excited about their work and make sure they like each other and coach them. And ugh, really, that's, you know what? I, when you picked up that sword, you signed up. And when you're like, what do they expect from me? Really? They expect me to do all this. This is what they expect. They did. Because when you picked it up, you know what you said? You said, I'm a superhero. That's what you said. And that's what they expect. Now you know you're not a superhero. I know you're not a superhero. And they kind of know that too, but they expect you to be one anyway. <laughs> right? That's what they expect. Because, and when you're a superhero, every problem is your problem. Every problem at the studio, it's like, well, you can't say, well, that's their problem. No, it's all your problem. It all goes to you. Right? And that sounds terrifying and daunting, but guess what? You can do it. You totally can. So I'm going to give you practical tips on how to be a superhero. All right, practical superhero tips. Number one, you want to get organized. 
Get yourself organized. Now, a lot of people are like, wait, I'm a creative person. I don't, like, organization is death. Organization is the end of the world. It's terrible. It's not right. I like what Flaubert had to say. Be regular and orderly in your life so you may be violent and original in your work, right? Being orderly is a way to be powerful. Or as Alton Brown says, organization will set you free. And who's your main enemy? The Sharknado, the opposite of chaos is order. You want to find ways to be orderly. When you are orderly, you protect your studio from the chaos that will rip it apart. So even if it's not in your nature, find ways to be orderly. And I'll give you some tips. One, get a notebook, because your memory, it sucks. People are like, hey, you need to do this. Oh yeah, I'll remember to do that. No, you won't. You totally won't. You've got a million things to think about. Your brain can think about five things at a time, if you're lucky, right? So. Get a notebook. I really recommend the book Getting Things Done. Um, it's a little out of date in practical wise, but philosophy wise, it really is great at helping you become an organized person. Note the subtitle, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity, because that's the goal, to be orderly in a stress-free way and get everything done. At a minimum, you're gonna want a to-do list, of course, so that you remember to do things. Uh, you're gonna, of course, you're gonna have a notebook for general notes about this and that, but you're also gonna need a hot list. And it took me a long time to understand about a hot list. I've been using uh, the same notebook now for 20 years. I'll show it to you here. Let's see, I have a notebook right there. I've had this notebook, for, I, I realized, for really 20 years, the same exact notebook. It's one of these notebooks where you can take the pages in and out so you can reorganize it. And you can see how I've done it here. I've got a bunch of tabs on the front page. Those are all the different things I have to keep track of. Some of them are people that I have to uh, uh, coach and manage. Some of them are projects I need to keep an eye on. And then so I have a page for each one. You see a sample page there on the right. And look, I keep it really simple. What a hot list is, it's not stuff I have to do. Um, it's stuff that I have to keep an eye on, that I have to remember to keep checking with the team about. Like, I'll, I'll see a thing and I'm like, ooh, those textures are ugly. And I'll say, when are you gonna fix those textures? They're like, oh, no, 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 pretty soon, maybe next week. So you write down ugly textures, right? And you put a little note, next week, they say they're gonna, they're gonna fix it. So that way, when you check in with the team, they're like, anything you wanna check on? I'm like, oh yeah, those ugly textures, did you fix those yet, right? So you remember to do that. Um, so having a hot list is very important. I'm a paper and pencil kind of guy, and so again, in terms of being organized, one of the things I always say, being organized is reaching for the ketchup, and it is there, right? So that's what organization is, right? It's not like you forgot to get the ketchup or you lost it or anything. So it's very important, I need an eraser for this. I know that sounds stupid, but I'm always, you write things and then you erase status things, but who has a pencil and an eraser with them? I do, because it's taped in the notebook. <laughs> Right? It's, it's, always, it's always right there. I, like, I can't possibly lose it. It's always right there. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but you have to come up with your systems, the systems that are going to work for you. You're going to think of things all the time. Write them down. Keep a notepad by the bed. If you don't do that, oh my God, keep a notepad by the bed. And why would you just keep it by the bed? Like you're shaving or whatever. Why wouldn't you have one in the medicine cabinet? You think of so many smart things then. You're like, oh, I'll remember that later. You won't. Write it down and get it in a notepad that goes somewhere. And yes, yes, this is totally a thing. In the shower one day, I was like, oh my God, waterproof paper, that would be genius. I should invent it. Someone already invented it. So keep a waterproof paper pad in the shower because you think of things in the shower. You know you do really important things. Write them down. All right, so get organized. You're like, ooh, who does that? A superhero. That's who does that. All right. So another practical tip. Running a studio, it's so tempting to run around firefighting all the time. There's sharknadoes breaking everything and causing fires all over the place, and you've got to help this, and you've got to fix this, and you've got to fix that. And it feels so productive when you're like putting out all these fires. But when you're doing that, you're not moving forward. You're just barely getting by. What you need is to find time so you can think ahead of like what happens next. What does the studio do next? Who do we need to hire next? You need time for that. You need to get beyond firefighting mode, okay? And there's a lot of ways to do that. One of them is to make time for yourself. On my calendar, every morning from nine to 10 is a block. It just says important work. During that period, I am not allowed to look at email. I am only allowed to do things on my to-do list, which are things that are kind of for getting out ahead of things. I, can't, I don't always hit it every day, but trying to have that discipline makes such a difference and makes things much, much calmer. Delegating is one of the hardest things for people. You started your own studio because you wanted to do everything. You want everything to be perfect your way, but you can't do everything. And pretty soon your people are going to start to hate you because stuff's not getting done because you're the bottleneck. 
right? And you don't want that. And you need to make time to do the important things. So you need to start experimenting with delegating, getting other people to do things, and figuring out what are the tasks you want to hold on to and what are the tasks you want to give to others. Another important one, keep doing what you're best at. Now, I know I just said, no, you can't work on the game anymore. You've got to focus on the people. Well, of course, the people are your top responsibility. But you're doing this because you have some genius with games. There's something you're super good at. Don't give it up because you're still good at it. Find a way that you can still do the parts that you're best at. Your team expects that from you. It's your superpower. It's one of your superpowers. Your team expects you to bring that thing you're best at and find a way to get that in there. Being humble is super important. It's real easy to pick up that sword and get real arrogant. And it leads to a downfall every single time. It leads to people not telling you the truth. It leads to all kinds of problems. And what do we call a superhero who's not humble? A villain. a villain, right? You might be a supervillain and you don't know it. And no one's going to tell you because you're such an arrogant pain in the ass, right? Um, and then that, that's, that's never good. So you want to be humble. Important, take care. You're, you're now going to be super busy. You're going to be so busy. You're doing this job 60, hour, 80 hours a week, whatever. It can be easy to run yourself into the ground and get a lot of bad habits. You need to find your healthy self. Find a way to kind of get healthy habits in your life because everybody needs you to do that. An unhealthy superhero uh, you know, who's coughing and wheezing uh, down the street and hyperventilating every time something goes wrong, it's like that's not going to work for you. And a phrase I got from Jeff Outlaw, one of the, one of the uh, senior producers at our studio, um, you eat last. Okay, think of a situation, we're bringing pizza in, we're having a big brainstorming party. Did we order enough pizza? I don't know, probably we did. Everybody's lining up getting pizza. Imagine a situation where like you eat first and then there's not enough pizza for somebody else. And then there you are, you know, running the studio and you're eating pizza and other people are like, oh man, I'm sorry, I was late. I was fixing all these bugs that we only have because the deadlines were so short. And, like, and what happens is people notice what you do. They notice. They're not always going to tell you that they notice. They notice what they do because they expect more from you than they expect from the other people they work with because you picked up that sword. They expect more from you. So you need to always remember, like, put the, everyone else first um, because that's what superheroes do. Okay, so there's some superhero tips. So let's get to the alphabet of happiness. We can do this. We're going to go through these and do these things. Now they're hard, and I know they're icky, and I know they're gross. Um, do I have to do them? Yes, you do, because you're holding the sword, so who else is going to do it? One way to think about why these are so important and, and what's important about them, for people, anyone who's taken a basic psychology class has run into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We often talk about it in terms of players and storytelling, but do you think about it in terms of the people in your studio? It's very, very relevant and valid, right? At the bottom are your basic physiological needs, and you say, well, what does that have to do with my studio? How do you think people pay for like food and water? And when people crunch and they're not sleeping, you're like taking away one of their basic physiological needs. And then after that, there's psychological needs. Uh, and you're like, well, what, a, you know, family, friendship, whatever, what does that have to do with anything? When you've got your staff like working 60 hours a week and they can't maintain their family relationships very well, like they've got all kinds of troubles and problems. Because the whole point of this hierarchy is the stuff at the top can't happen unless the stuff lower down is taken care of. And what's at the top? At the very top, we have like people achieving their full potential, right, and, 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 uh, and doing creative activities. How are they going to be great game developers if the things underneath are like falling apart in their lives? It, it, they can do it for a little while, but they can't sustain it. And so you need to always keep an eye out for like, do, does everyone have all their needs fulfilled? And even look at that level four, esteem needs. Like if you're just barking at the team all the time and they're feeling like, oh man, yeah, geez, I guess maybe we do kind of suck. Like again, they're not going to be their best creative selves. So some concrete things that you can do. All right. A, adequate salary. Well, that's kind of straightforward. People need to get paid. And, and, but the problem is now it's your job to figure out how much is that? How much should people get paid? Here, here's my pro tip. Ask them, right? So, you know, how much, how much would you be looking to make at this job? And they'll tell you. And if you're like, oh, like we can afford that, then you say, yeah, okay, that's great. And if you're thinking, uh-oh, no, we can't. 
then you figure out, well, well, what can we afford? And you tell them and they'll decide, right? And that way, either way, like they decided, yeah, okay, I'm doing it. And then uh, you'll, they'll be starting on a basis of some kind of adequate salary. You know, it's, an, it's, it's a simple but important thing. Second one, people need to believe in what they're doing, especially in something like games. Games is a passion-based industry. And they need to believe in the mission, not just the mission of this particular game. Like, where's this studio going? What are we doing after this game? What is this place really all about? I was working at a place once, and I asked the boss that. I'm like, what, what exactly is our goal? And he's like, you know, I don't know, make cool stuff. I don't know. And it was so unsatisfying to realize, my god, he has no plan. We're just going to drift around from one thing to the next. That doesn't feel great. I want to feel like I'm part of something important. Now, some people say, oh, really, I'm going to make a mission statement? That sounds like the most corporate thing ever. And yet, if you make a crap mission statement, it is, <laughs> right? But you should, are you doing this for an important reason or not? And the answer might be, no, I'm not doing it for an important reason. But if you are, you should be able to say what that is. That's the mission statement. Now, it takes some thinking, and it takes some work, and it takes some, some bravery to be able to, to do it. I really recommend reading this book, The Advantage, by Patrick Lencioni. It is, it is short and it is great. It is all about that the main advantage an organization can have is to be healthy. And he gives all these tips, and one of them is about coming up with clear mission statements, clear core values, clear principles. And so following the template of that, one of the things like we've done at our studio is we have, you know, we have this little sheet right here where we have our clear mission statement, our clear core values, uh, we have a bunch of principles. I'm not going to get into all those. And you'll notice at the bottom, top priority right now. And this is our current studio priority, which we decided is protect and leverage our VR, AR momentum. Now, you might say one priority. But like, yeah, you can only have one top priority. That's how top priority works. And so there I labeled everything. And that's, that's the thing. And if you want to download these slides later, you can, you can check all that stuff out as a sample. And, but the important thing is that you have these discussions with yourself and with the team to figure out what are we about, what is important to us, and guess what? You can change them later if you realize that you picked the wrong ones. You can do that. It's okay. But you need to be brave enough to step up and say, this is what we're about, and say it in front of everybody and get them to believe it. And it's tough, right, because it, people are scared to put these principles down because this means, oh my God, what if I don't always do these? This means I'm going to be a hypocrite and people will call me out. Yes, that's right, they will. People will call you out for going against your own values. You want that to happen. You want that to happen. It's helpful. It hurts, but it, it help. it's helpful. Culture is really important. Everyone that says culture is so important. How do you engineer an excellent culture? Well, you can't engineer an excellent culture. Cultures grow. That's what cultures do. They grow from the, how people interact with each other. And so that starts with you. How do you interact with everybody else? And then how do they interact with each other? That's all a culture is. And so focus on those interactions, and you'll have an excellent culture. It's not about, I mean, we have jelly beans in the break room. It's not about that. It's about how people interact with each other. A big part of your job is removing distractions. One of the horrible things, Sharknadoes can crop up, crop up inside the studio. They don't all come from outside. You can get two people together who just don't get along and suddenly you have chaos. And that's your problem to solve. So chaos can come from anywhere and you have to keep an eye out for it. You need to look for it and you need to find ways to deal with it. People always say, oh, I hated working at that one place because it had so much politics. What is politics? Politics is one person wants to tell something to someone else, but they can't. They're just, they're, they're afraid to, they have this reason and they, that reason, they can't tell them, so they go and tell other people. Oh, did you hear what that guy said and this and that? That's when politics begins. You need to look for that and weed that out and not let that happen. And of course, it can come from you yourself and you have to watch for that. Great advice from Ed Catmull, another excellent book, Creativity Inc., his tale of how Pixar was created and formed, and he has all these leadership lessons in there. A lot of great quotes in that book. You have problems you know and problems you don't know. And realizing this, realizing, of course we all know we have problems we know, and we're trying to fix those problems, but acknowledging that you also have problems you don't know means you're going to keep an eye out for problems that you're like not even aware of yet. It's very important. And the other phrase he uses, the good hides the bad. 
When things are going really well at the studio, no one wants to tell you about some crappy situation where there's a fight between the art and engineering department because people feel bad that they've got this crappy thing going on when everything's so good. Because when things are good, when things are bad, everyone will talk about all the bad things. When things are good, the good things hide the bad things. So don't fall under the illusion like, oh, everything seems to be going so well. You still must weed out these hidden problems. And a, and a very important thing he mentions, only the leaders can remake the rules of the studio. Sometimes you have rules, written or unwritten, at the studio that are broken and bad. And the, the, most of the people in the studio can't do anything about it. It's just they, they don't see it as something within their power. It's only within your power. Um, Ed Catmull tells this great story about this really bad design table they had that was long and skinny, and the people who sat in the middle of it were the important people, and people on the ends didn't really get to participate very much. And everyone knew it was bad, but no one would say anything because they were like, obviously management likes this because that's why they put this table here, right? And uh, eventually they had to realize, oh my God, we have to change this, and it was a big deal. I had a situation on I Expect You to Die. We'd been very, very budget conscious because we'd had a history in the past of sometimes going over budget on internal projects. So we'd really clamp down on it. We had rules about, you know, this is the budget and that's that. The team came up with this brilliant idea to do this opening credit song sequence. And they were like, oh, this is great, but you know, we can't do it because it's just not in the budget. And no one even wanted to bring it up with me. They didn't even want to say it because they were sure I would shoot it down. And then I happened to see it and I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazing. We have to do this. And they're like, and so here I am, I'm the head of the company telling them we have to do this. And they're like, we can't. <laughs> I'm like, well, why can't we? Oh, it's just the budget, it's not there. I'm like, we'll change the budget. And everyone's like, wait, we can change the budget, <laughs> right? And get, like, because, so that's one of the things, when, you're, when you end up in a leadership position, you have to look for places the rules need to be remade. People need to not just believe in their work and believe in the mission, they need to be excited about it. They need to be enthusiastic. And you're like, of course they are, they're making games, it's awesome. Are they? Really? Maybe, maybe not. You need to talk to people, you need to ask, check in with people about how they're feeling about the work. You need to ask just in case. People need to feel cared about. It's important. It's one of the things that really improves their self-esteem. And um, it's not, and, and you might say, of course, you know, they get paid, they get to make games, of course they feel cared about. But re is that really true? Like, what have you done to really show you care how they feel, right? And a great way to do that is to ask them how they feel. I like this phrase, I forgot, I forgot to say I care. And it's easy, it's an easy thing to forget. So the best way to do this is first you have to actually care, right? If you don't actually care, you're gonna have a hard time. But first you have to actually care, but that's not enough. Then you have to back that up by doing things that caring people do, and even that's not enough. Then you have to tell people anyway about that you care how they feel and that you wanna know how do you feel about this. I'm gonna lump these next two together because they have a lot to do with each other. Good feedback and helpful coaching. This is one of the hardest things. I, for me personally, this was really, really hard. And I, I think we still struggle with it a bit, but uh, it was a turning point for me to realize how important these things are, that people really need excellent feedback about what they're doing. I personally believe 360 feedback, where you collect feedback from people's peers about each other, about what, is, what are they good at, what do they need to get better at, is really important. They can't give it to each other directly because it's too dangerous. It's too, it could cause too much tension. So you create a situation where it has to th flow through studio leadership, where people say, here's what I liked about this person, and here's where this person needs to improve, and then the, the manager as coach needs to kind of sit down with people and say, you know, here's what people uh, feel like you need to get better at, and so you need to get that feedback. A thing you need to come to terms with, who are your A, B, and C players? Who are your people who are excellent? Who are your people who are, yeah, they're okay. And who are your people who are having trouble? Nobody likes to face this. You don't like to face the fact that, yeah, that one guy is not really doing very well. I'm just gonna try and not think about it because I wanna avoid it. You need to think about it because that person who's not doing very well, you could have an A player in there instead and imagine how much better everything would be. And their life won't end if they have to end up leaving the studio. And maybe if you actually confronted their problem, maybe you'd help them deal with it and they'd get better, right? But ignoring the C players is just unacceptable. 
because people need to know where they stand. They need you to tell them, like, how am I doing? Am I doing well? How, how do, how do, and if not, how can I get better? And the C players, you need to find a way to get them better, and if you can't get them better, you need to get them out. And it sucks, nobody likes firing people, it sucks to have to do it, but you have to do it. And people's lives don't end when they get fired. Often it's better, they're like, oh, I was really struggling, there's one place I got fired, and man, I found a place I fit in much better, and I'm doing better work, it happens all the time. So, coaching. You must make time for one-on-one -on -one coaching meetings. It always feels like, oh, I don't have time for this, we've got to focus on the game, and I've got to focus on all these fires. You need to make time to sit down with people and say, how's it going? What's going well? What do you need help with? What are problems that you have? You need to give your people time to, to talk through their problems so they can get advice from you or from somebody. And this really, as a leader, this is your number one priority. One-on-one -on -one meetings with the people you work with is the best thing you can do to help make them great. And it's scary because you don't know the perfect way to do it, and you don't know exactly what to say, and you don't have to have all the answers. We've all had the situation where you go and you, you go to somebody with a problem and like you talk through the problem and then you realize the solution in your own brain just through talking about it, right? Just, and the more you do it, you're just gonna get better at it anyway. And this is a great time for you to have your core valuables, your core principles and your core values um, ready, like I always keep them on a little sheet of paper right nearby when we have these meetings. So when someone did something really great, I can say, hey man, that's really great. You're really embodying like what we're about. Or someone did something that's questionable, I can say, well, I don't think that was good. Or I can say, hey, look guy, principle number four, like we've talked about this, like why are you going against it? Let's talk about it in a concrete way. And very efficient, help people coach each other, make opportunities for people to get together and just share their problems with each other and uh, just create those opportunities, get them scheduled. And, and I remember the first time I finally figured out to do that and people were like, wow, I didn't know that like, we were allowed to do this. I'm like, yeah, okay, right, no, it is really useful and sort of obviously useful, but like, no one ever said this was a good thing to do. Two amazing books by the same people, by Stone and Heen, um, Difficult Conversations, this is all about how do you have difficult conversations in a productive, useful way, and related, thanks for the feedback. It's, real, it's a book about how to take feedback, but in doing so, it's really about how to give the best possible feedback. And one thing I've been doing recently, I totally recommend, get a tool for anonymous feedback. We've been using this one called Office Vibe, it's, it's expensive, I'll put it out there. We're a little debate about it, like is this really worth it, but like we feel like it is. And what this does is it sends little quizzes, easy little surveys to people about how you feel about your project, how you feel about your coworkers, how you feel about your boss. Just little simple things, simple, simple little web things, just, just like one or two questions a week, real simple. And then it collects all that data and it shares the data with management in an anonymous way. So you can kind of see the vibe of like what's going on in there. But most important, this is the most valuable part, people can kind of, there's free form open boxes, people can kind of type stuff in and you get it all and it's all anonymous. So it's like a suggestion box of the things people are concerned about. And here's the best part, you can answer the questions anonymously. You're not anonymous, they know it's you, you're the boss, they know that. But you don't know who asked it. So someone's like, man, I'm really upset by this one thing, this project got canceled, and like, I think we're going on the wrong track. And you'd be like, whoa, like, I haven't heard about this. And you can say, hey, anonymous, um, let me tell you, like, I really think this is better, and here's the reasons why it's so much better. And sometimes they come back, they're like, first they're like, oh my God, I just, like, my big serious complaint, I'm like, the boss just, like, got me a letter back and sometimes they're like, oh, that actually made sense and they write back to you and they say, oh, thanks for explaining that. I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't understand. I've had no other way to get information like that. So I, like finding a tool for anonymous feedback is great. You can check out my talk from last year. It was all about information flow in the studio. One of the great things in this Patrick Lencioni book, he uses a, 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 a term that is super valuable, over communication. He points out that people can't read your mind, and as a leader, you must over-communicate the things that are important. You must say them not just once, you can't be just like, oh, I said it, they all know. You need to say it again and again to the point where you're a little embarrassed, right? Because a repetition of important things is helpful, because they're important, right? So you should repeat important things. You should be saying important things again and again in different ways. Because it's better for people to hear, you get the idea, but look how uncomfortable it is, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Important things, you should repeat them, right? Yeah. So, a joint feeling of respect, 
right? You want to feel respected by people. People want to feel respected by you. You want to look for these situations. This is back to this notion of are you yourself good at making others feel respected? And you need to look inside yourself and make sure that that's really true. Keeping communication comfortable, because when it's not comfortable, it stops. And that's when politics begins. One of the things, as a game designer, I feel like my most important discovery is this reading some psychology neurology paper and realizing that we have two different circuits in our brains, that the circuits for avoiding negative consequences and the circuits for seeking positive consequences are completely different brain systems. And we see this in game design all the time, this moment when people switch from reward seeking to punishment avoiding, it's very important for game design. It's also very important for your studio. Why are people communicating with you? Are they communicating, are they communicating with you because they have to? Or they're communicating with you because they want to. Everything will be different. If you're the kind of person who's tough to talk to, and they're like, oh, I don't want to talk to that guy. Like, you, the people are using a totally different part of their brain. And how's it going in your studio? How's the communication going? When is it comfortable? When is it uncomfortable? Uh, people want to like their teammates. And I know that sounds sort of simple and sort of straightforward, but it's true and it's important. And when you interview people, you should be thinking about likability. Who is going to fit in with the culture and how are people going to like each other? And if you check out last year's talk, I talked a lot about the, the uh, research evidence that shows that likability is more important than how good somebody is at their job. That sounds crazy, but it's totally true, and you can, you can hear the complicated story about it, but you want to focus, you want to think about making sure people like each other. Um, it's one of the main reasons people quit a studio. It's like I couldn't stand the people I was working with. And the last part of the alphabet is measurable progress. People really want measurable progress. We know that we're game designers. Oh my God, how do we not know that? We, we do know that, but we so rarely um, design it well into our studios. And it comes from so many places. It can certainly come from the project. We're making great progress on the project. I feel really great about that. Raises are really important. Did you ever think about why we have inflation here on planet Earth? Every nation has inflation. Why should it be that prices and salaries gradually rise over time? Shouldn't it drift up and drift down? No, it gradually rises because human beings like progress, even if we have to make it up, <laughs> right? So figuring out the raises that are gonna feel like good measurable progress for people is very important and very tricky. People's growing responsibility and getting a more and more responsibility is important. And of course, you want to make it clear, measurably clear, letting people know that like I'm now, you know, yeah, we're giving you these new responsibilities and, and we're looking forward to you taking care of those. One thing people talk about is the Peter principle. This is a famous thing in large organizations. The idea that people get promoted, you know, you're good at your job, we're going to promote you. Oh, you're good at your job, we're going to promote you. And when do we stop? We stop when you suck at your job. And what that means is ultimately you're going to have an organization full of people who suck at their job, right? And, that's, and some people are like, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just what happens. It's not true. The way you do it is don't promote people until they've already been doing the new job for a while. Because if they do the new job and they suck, don't promote them. But if they do the new job and they're great, well, then you promote them and you avoid the Peter Principle. So job titles and figuring that out is important. And I know it sounds silly, like, oh, really, just a name, just a label? You're game designers. Oh, my God, you know that. You know how important just some bogus title is into making someone feel good about themselves? You know that. Clear feedback, of course, about exactly are you good at your job? Are you getting better or not? And having your manager tell you, yeah, you're really getting better. I really see you getting better. And being very clear about that is important. And then, of course, watching a studio grow itself, which sometimes happens with studios, that can feel like progress to people as well. So I'm going to talk about some studio growth rules of thumb. Uh, just real, real quick here. If you have more than five people, that's at the point where you need a producer. And you're going to need another producer for every 10 developers that you get. If you have more than 10 people in your studio, you're going to find you're needing sub-team meetings to get certain kinds of communication to happen. When you've got small studios, you don't have to think about communication so much. It just happens. Everybody's just there. Once you get more than 10, you have to organize and plan the communication, or it doesn't happen. Once you get more than 20 people, like coaching isn't going to happen so naturally anymore. You need to assign formal coaching responsibilities. 
Once you get more than 30, you better get a full-time IT guy. I'll just say that, it's important. And you're gonna need one every 50 more developers you get. Uh, once you get to around 40 people, you're gonna find you need departments of some kind. A flat architecture is not gonna work for you anymore, and you're gonna need leaders to lead up these departments. And by 50, you'll probably need full-time HR, you'll probably need full-time accounting and finance. Once you get to 60, you're gonna need two layers of management for coaching inside departments. I heard when Media Molecule was formed, the, the guys who do Little Big Planet, they said, um, we're, uh, our plan is to not have to get bigger than 30 because we've had the best experiences with no more than 30 devs. So we're gonna design games that only need 30 devs. Now I just looked at their website, they have 51 devs right now. So I, I think what I suspect is they're pushing up against that 60 number. They don't wanna, they don't, they don't in a place where they wanna have those two layers. And I, you know, we're up to 105, I'm not really seeing too many more barriers right now, but I'll tell you this, once you reach 150, and I've seen this again and again, you hit Dunbar's number, this is an innate human thing, you can read all about it, and your organization will split in two. It's just what happens with human primates. Now, when do you, should you get business development? When should you get marketing? I can't give you guidelines on that. Some people start with it at day one, some people don't need to start with it till later, you said, but you're gonna need it sometime, so you better figure that out. Okay, back to the plan. You built a studio, you protected the studio, and now you're focusing a lot on optimizing the studio. But you're still a little bit sad because I didn't really want to think about people all day. I wanted to think about games. That's why I did this. I want to think about games all day. And I'll give you a secret. The studio is a game. <laughs> and the people who work there are the players. And everything you know about game design, you can use to make that studio great. And if you do that, you're going to make a studio that doesn't just make games and doesn't just make money, but is gonna create joy for every single person who interacts with it at all. And it's gonna be the hardest damn game that you have ever worked on but I'm here to tell you, you can do it. <laughs> Thanks very much. It looks like I used up all the time. I'm happy to chat with people afterwards. Please don't forget to fill out your surveys and have a great GDC.